Everybody in this room knows that the economic winds have shifted. And we're going to have to navigate these new winds in different ways than we were running our business prior to a year ago. When we talk to the thousands of companies that we talk to every single year, we hear these themes over and over and over again. It's almost like tech companies are operating on a compass. And that compass has certain points, certain directions they want to head. Sometimes they want to grow. That's their focus. Other times, like more recently, they're in cost containment mode or cost reduction mode. Sometimes they think it's all about new products. And sometimes, increasingly, they think it's about the customer experience. But I got to tell you, these are not all equal points on the compass. In a perfect world, we would be able to effectively execute on all four things at once. We'd be able to grow certain parts of our business, reduce costs in other parts of our business. We'd be able to create new great products and features and at the same time build a fantastic customer experience. But the truth of the matter is, we have tendencies. We have tendencies. We love to grow the top line. We're much more comfortable growing the top line than we are in cost-cutting mode. Yeah? Right? We love to gas up the sales force. Right? We love to go out and do all kinds of acquisitions. We're much more comfortable in growth mode than we are in cost reduction mode. And the tendencies go in both directions. We're much more comfortable adding features and capabilities to products and investing like that than we are in thinking about how do we really create an effective customer experience across the entire life cycle. It's just a fact. We love the Northwest. We love high growth driven by great features and functions in our products. We love that. Those strategies built your company. And it's what the executives know how to do. It's what made money. They're super excited about it. But we have less experience when the winds have turned. And ladies and gentlemen, the winds have turned, right? We have to react to the changing environment. And the question is, how will you react? How will your company handle these changes? You know how to run plays in the Northwest. You know how to develop new capabilities. You know how to do marketing. You know how to hire salespeople. You know how, how to set high quotas and grow, 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 grow. We know those plays. And just cutting those plays in an economic environment like this is not a strategy. How many times have you read over the course of the last couple of months, we, quote, overhired the sales force? Right? We overhired the sales force. So our strategy, our strategy, is to reduce headcount. Reduce headcount in the areas that we, quote, overhired. That sounds to me a lot like running the old plays and just snipping them off. What we really need is to design new plays that are designed to both improve the customer experience and cut costs. You want to know where AI is going to help first in our business? Right there. Right there. That's where AI is going to help first. But we need to define new plays in an area that's quite frankly not historically been our favorite place. We like that up and to the left, grow, 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 new products and sales force. We love that. We know how to run those plays. We don't know so much how to run these plays that the new economic wins are telling us we've got to get better at. What are the two things that we need to do? One is we need to define the new plays and get super good at the new plays. And that's what this event is all about. You're going to hear Thomas come out in a minute and talk about 12 plays 
that we're seeing effective companies run that I would argue are sort of in this quartile of the compass. The second thing we're going to do is in Las Vegas, we're going to talk about the number one challenge that you have all got, which is that these plays require cross-functional activity. We have got to break down the organizational silos that are going to prevent these plays from running. We're going to have to get organizations to collect data that they're not the primary beneficiaries of, that somebody else further down in the life cycle needs, right? A cost incurred here to generate a result on somebody else's P&L, right? We're going to have to reorganize ourselves with the customer's life cycle in mind, not our individual stovepipe P&Ls. So I would submit to you that over the course of the next six months, the two most important conversations that are going to happen in the tech industry are happening at these two events. This event is about the path to profitable X as a service and what are the plays we need to be running to not just cut the old strategies down, but actually build new muscle, the kind of new capability that is going to allow us to both grow and be more profitable. And then in the fall, we're going to come back and we're going to talk about silo busting. We're going to talk about what we need to do to put silos in the back seat in our, both our organizational structure and our P&L orientation. These two events are where the next generation of business operating models for in tech and industrial companies are going to get developed and we're going to develop it together. And to get us started to talk about 12 key plays that everybody in this company, everybody in this organization needs to be able to go run inside your own businesses, I want to introduce our executive vice president and head of research, Thomas Law. I think everybody in this room is familiar with the fact that technology companies have taken a significant haircut in their valuations. And I bet that is personal to everyone in this room. Maybe you have some stock options that are worth less. Maybe you own stock in a tech company that's worth less. Maybe you work for a private company with hoping to go public and it's been delayed because your valuation is down. So I'm sure that is personal to all of you. But what about the people that aren't in this room anymore? I have lived through three downturns in tech. Uh, the most recent was 2008, 2009. Two year period, we took out 130,000 jobs. Dot com bust. Two year period, 2000, 2001, 300,000 jobs. In the last year and a half, not even two years, tech has taken out over a half million jobs. And the talk track is we're just cutting fat. We got ahead of our skis, we did a lot of hiring during the pandemic. I read an interview uh, about two months ago, recently laid off tech worker. And they said, you know, I didn't even have anything to do. I'm not surprised they laid me off. Three weeks ago, I was supposed to record a Tectonic podcast episode with a VP of CS who came to me highly recommended. And the day before we were going to record, I received an email. And they say, hey, Thomas, I'm sorry, I, I can't record tomorrow. My company is in the process of laying off 20% of our workforce, and I'm one of those people. I don't think that's fat anymore. We are into muscle, we are into bone. And I have to say, I think it's worse than a lot of people think. 
And hey, I opened with Tolstoy, so you knew this was going to be a little dark, okay? <laughs> How many people are familiar with the greater fool theory of investing? Raise your hand, because this is a real thing. I'm not making this up. Really? Not too many hands up. So this theory basically says, I will invest in a company, and maybe it's a little shaky, maybe it's not profitable, the financials aren't super solid, but as long as I am confident that other people are going to be excited about this company, and I can sell it at a higher price, I'll place that bet, right? So as long as I can find a greater fool, a greater optimist, I'll place that bet. That theory of investing, combined with historically low interest rates, i.e. free money, has fueled the absurd valuations in tech for the last 15 years. And that came to a crashing halt last year. If you don't know this data, this is VCs exiting last year. It fell off a cliff. You know why? No greater fools ready to catch. People are nervous about these unprofitable companies. And if you're a VC and you can't take your money out, right, you've already invested, you're not going to put more money in. So look at what happened to new incremental investment. Article in the Wall Street Journal today. If you want investment right now, you better have AI <laughs> in your title somewhere. Nobody else is getting investment. And we all know the story of Silicon Valley Bank this year, but I think the real story was last year. Look what was happening to their deposits. They were bleeding cash. Why? Their customers are tech companies. Those tech companies were burning through cash, and there was no fresh funding. So all this is swirling around. There's been this massive pivot, and it's creating some unhappy stories. And I want to tell you three of them. And the first one is what I will call the disappointing wedge. And these are SaaS companies. They've been around for a while, trying to grow, grow, grow. And they were hoping they were going to have this wedge model where I build this platform, I get more and more customers, and eventually I become super profitable. Economies of scale, unit economics. That's not what happened. Their expenses kept pace sometimes faster than their revenues. Revenue growth is expensive. They're sitting on an unprofitable business model, and right now they are pretty unhappy. Here's another story of unhappiness. These are companies that have been around for a while. They had legacy products. They started to bolt in some of these new as-a-service products. And they have a pretty complex portfolio right now. And so those vertical lines, just think of them as a bunch of different products. And when you have a big, complex portfolio, you want some synergies. What do you want? Maybe you get synergies on how you develop product. More importantly, you get synergies on how you go to market. You take all your products and you put them into your awesome go-to-market engine. And you get synergies in services. It's why we build global service organizations, so we can do things like support, et cetera, at scale. And you go up to your customer, and you say, hey, one plus one equals three. The reason you want to buy from me is I put all this stuff together, and I make it work, and it's seamless. These companies are unhappy right now, many of them, because the portfolio is a little dysfunctional. It's stovepiped development. For go-to-market, it's very complex, so they have to put all these specialists in play. We just did some research on specialists, sales specialists. You know what happens when you put a sales specialist in play? They never go away. <laughs> they never go away. And then when you look at services, I am seeing some companies decompose service motions, like support. And they're saying, let's put that back with the product folks, because we can't get this handshake right. And you put that all together, and you come to your customer, and the customer starts thinking, what's the advantage here? of buying from you, because you're really not putting this stuff together in a meaningful way. One more story of unhappiness. And this is one 
of anxiety. So there are companies, some of them in this room here, sitting on profitable business models, traditional, make, sell, ship, life is pretty good, but they have anxiety. Why? Because they know software is eating through the world. They know this as-a-service stuff that's coming. They know that their industry is going to go through some digital transformation, and they're asking themselves, how do I make money in that new world? What's this going to mean to me? So there's a lot of unhappiness out there right now. How are we going to get out of this? How are we going to get out of this? Traditionally, we really like to do M&A. But if you take an unprofitable SaaS company, and you smash it together with an unprofitable SaaS company, you have an unprofitable business still, right? You have a complex portfolio, throwing more shit into that is not gonna help the cause. And if you're a traditional company making money and you were gonna acquire some new digital capabilities as a service, now you're super nervous about that. Well, there's another way you can get things right here. You can try to cut your way to success. What's the easiest thing to do, folks? Get rid of people. Easiest thing to do. But if you are still sitting on a flawed business model, a flawed set of plays, you haven't solved the problem yet. Now, there's a couple other tactics I do see. We can just wait. Let's just wait. This inflation thing, it's, it's transitory. That's right, it's transitory. Interest rates, they're gonna go back to historical lows pretty soon, right? Let's just wait. Maybe we can hope. Let's hope customers want to go back to the good old days, right? Where we can just throw the technology over the wall. It's their problem. This whole, I want value. I want outcomes. I don't want to pay for what I'm using. They're going to be like, oh, no, I want to go back to the old way. Maybe, maybe we pray. What? for the greater fools to show back up. Make all of this go away. The TSIA, we do not believe any of those are the winning tactics. Here's what we need to do. As JB just put on the table, there is this massive pivot from just focusing on revenue growth at any cost, leading with our new whiz -bang technology, and really thinking about customer experience, bringing out complexity, and getting our business models profitable in an as-a-service posture, because the as-a-service stuff has not gone away. So that journey looks like this. We're going to go left to right. What does that mean? On the left is a typical SaaS business model, 37% on sales and marketing, 32 points on COGS, unprofitable. We have to shrink sales and marketing costs. We have to shrink COGS to be profitable. And everybody in this room has a role to play. I, I don't care if you're in sales, services, product, finance, marketing, you have a role to play. And as we go on this journey, we need to start speaking the language of profitable companies. What do investors care about? Gap margin. <laughs> Gap OI and growth rate. We can't have any of these funky metrics anymore. Now, are you ready for some good news? <laughs> right here, yes, please, this is killing me. All right, here's some good news. That's what good news looks like. <laughs> we all know that if you put a frog in room temperature water and you put the heater up very slow, that eventually that frog will die. They, won't, they don't notice the temperature change, right? You all know that story, right? Most people don't know. That story is bullshit. <laughs> true. If that story was true, on a, on a day that warmed up and you're walking along a pond, you'd see all these dead frogs that forgot to jump because it was getting hot. That story is bullshit. And I tell you that because it is used as an analogy for companies, right? Back in my MBA days. Well, you know the frog story. These companies don't move fast enough, and they end up just dying in that pot. 
They don't. You can move. You can jump, okay? It's not too late. Second part of the good news is we know exactly where to jump. We have been studying what profitable as a service looks like for over a decade. And I can tell you definitively, there are three levers that you can pull to make your business models more profitable. Monetize services, migrate commercials, modify the growth engines. And I'm going to talk about each, three, each of these. And I'm going to start with monetizing services, my favorite. So again, we've been studying this for years. We just did a survey about two months ago asking people, where do you put your CS expenses, customer success, that, that you're not monetizing? And most people put that in technology calls. So it depresses the margin on your big gear there. Next most common bucket is sales and marketing. What we need to do is by monetizing services, if you're putting that in sales and marketing, you're going to reduce sales and marketing costs. If you're putting that in technology cogs, you're going to make your margin better there. It's the left to right motion. But there is going to be some resistance. If you have not monetized services or you're not doing it that much, you're, I know this playbook, for, you know, the, re, the resistance is going to come from. And it's going to start with sales. And they're going to say, the customer won't pay for that. It's too late. That ship has sailed. In the world of SaaS, we threw all that stuff in. They're conditioned not to pay for it. Have you, have you heard that? Yes. yes. Of course you have. A lot of you are in services, right? That, too, is bullshit. We survey on this. But half the SaaS companies out there, 51%, are monetizing some aspects of CES. When it comes to technical support, about 82% of SaaS companies are monetizing some premium technical support motions. When it comes to professional services, this is really interesting. Traditional software companies that now have PS, about 100% of the time, PS is profitable. Why? Because those companies learned 20 years ago in the old software model, it was a shit show for PS. My first book, Building Professional Services in a Product Company, I wrote it because it was a shit show. Software companies were losing money, should we charge for it, customers won't pay for it, all the same arguments. And all those enterprise software companies figured out how to monetize it and make it profitable. And when they started to stand, stand up SaaS, they didn't lose that muscle. They said, oh, you know, we're going to run this profitably. Born in the cloud SaaS companies, not so much. Right? It can be done. And I'll also tell you, born in the cloud SaaS companies, traditional software companies that have SaaS are doing a much better job of monetizing services around that SaaS. You can learn from what they're doing there. OK, so here's the second pushback you're going to get. Well, you know, Thomas, uh, you know, I was talking to a, a colleague at Microsoft. And you know, they give consulting away to drive workloads on Azure. And then someone else will say, well, I was talking to a colleague at Google. And they do the same thing. That's, that's great. That's fine. I'm not saying you have to monetize everything. And we have a framework for this. It's called the Service Monetization Threshold. What does this mean? If you have a service motion that is in your best interest to run, onboarding, consulting to drive workloads, whatever, some adoption work, so they renew, don't charge for that. That's fine. Do it for free. But if you have a service motion that unlocks business value for the customer, you damn well better charge for that. Simple example, Salesforce has something called Outcome Accelerators. You can go look on their website. It's a premium service motion designed to unlock specific business value, and they monetize that as they should. And if you are arm wrestling over this topic, I wrote a paper about a year and a half ago, should we charge for this? Go read that. Go take it into your head of sales, your CFO. That's the conversation. But it can be done. Now, one more pushback you're going to get. 
It's going to be from the cranky CFO. And they're going to not like monetizing services because it dilutes their business model. The margins on services are bad. And I'm in this conversation all the time with CFOs now, even more so. And let me kind of tell you how it goes. I say, hey, you need to monetize services. And the CFO says, but that's going to make my business model look like crap. I hate those low margins. And then I show them this slide. And I said, wait, you mean that, that crappy business model you already have? That's a typical SaaS business model right there, underwater. And then I show them this slide, and I explain what we're talking about here, making the business model look more attractive. And then I show them one more slide. It, it, this is interesting. So CFOs, you think they're kind of number driven? I find if you just use simple pictures, they track a lot better. I don't know why, but that's just what I find. I know there are CFOs in the audience. I respect what you're doing, especially now. It, it ain't easy. But if you're a CFO, just keep following with me. One more slide for you. So basically, I said, this is your current economic engine. Typical SaaS company, 90% of revenue in the big, one big gear, a lot of free stuff going on there, and about 10% of revenue coming from professional services often break even or unprofitable. I said, look, all we're talking about is diversifying your economic engine, and we've been studying this for a decade, and we can tell you definitively, when you diversify the economic engine, you get a profitable business model. You stay 90-10, you struggle. Full stop. Now, if you want to put some of this stuff into one big, you know, as a service gear, what you're monetizing is in CS or ES or whatever, that's fine too. Again, I'll use Salesforce. Go to their 10K. They only have two gears. They have this one big as a service gear and they've got this PS gear. But in that one big gear, there's technology, there's premium CS, etc. So you can report it the way you want but underneath the covers, diversify the economic engine. And again, when we look, um, traditional software companies more likely to have profitable SaaS. Companies that are monetizing CS more likely to have profitable SaaS. But wait, there's more. More benefits from monetizing services. Again, we've been studying this for years. If you're monetizing CS, your dollar expansion rates are higher. But there's more. If you monetize CS, your dollar retention rate is better. There's more. If you monetize CS, your NPS score are higher. Why? Because you're feeding the beast. You're able to fund service motions that are driving and unlocking value with your customers. A whole laundry list here of the reasons to, to monetize, do the hard work of monetizing services. And I'm sure still there are some of you sitting here going, but man, this is a really steep hill to climb in my company. How many people still feel like this? Let me see. I need some hands. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I have to ask you, and you have to ask your executive team, what's going to be harder? Learning to monetize services, which can be done, or to continue to simply try to cut your way to success. What is going to be harder? That's the first big lever. Second big lever is migrating commercials. And let's do a little interact poll here. Are you ready? I want to know who owns renewals at your company. And these are the four most common models we see, right? A sales account executive, renewal specialist in sales, a renewal specialist in services, or maybe even your CSM. Let's see where the, where the world is sitting on this. Come on, let's keep those votes. Let's get the data to stabilize. Sales renewal specialist leading the pack. Sales account executive trying to catch up. Come on, keep going. Sales account executive, barely in number two. Oh, man, flipping back and forth here. OK, we can, we can cut. So sales account executive, right behind a sales renewal specialist. So this is something we've been advocating for quite a while. 
And that is that you need to become much more nuanced on how you pick the money off the table. Sales does not need to own everything. Focus your account executives on the complex transactions, the big dollar transactions. And it's, this is very simple math, folks. If you have a salesperson own the renewal, you're going to pay the most. Okay? Renewal specials, less CSM, even more cost effective. And here is the key thing. There's not a degradation of performance. Right? Salespeople will go, oh my gosh, you take renewals away, they're just going to tank. We have the data, that's not true. So why, are we, why is sales account executive still number two? Doesn't make any sense. I'll give you more data. If you keep renewals with sales, companies that do that, their overall growth rate is lower. Why? Because salespeople are chasing down paperwork for some mundane renewal instead of knocking down doors for the next new logo, the next big cross-sell. Now let's talk about expansion. How many of you, another poll, how many of you have uh, CSMs that have any incentives to expand existing customers? Yes, no, you're not sure. Let's see where people are on this one. Wow, starting out strong on the yes. That's a good sign. The people that are not sure are already saying, when I get back to the office, I'm going to find out. <laughs> I got to get the answer to this. So, all right, a little over half of you have adopted this practice, which is fantastic. Let's, let's cut back to the slides. So again, we've been studying this for years, and we know that companies that do that, right, their growth rates are better. We know that renewal rates are better when CSMs have expansion targets. Why? Why? Because what we have found is that customers, you start a contract with them, and if they do little expansions with you before the big renewal, renewal rate's higher. If they buy and they don't do anything until the renewal, right, a little more risk there. So that it behooves you to have CSMs focused on that. So migrating commercials, and there's more plays here, as JB mentioned, um, and I'll, I'll give you a paper here, point you to a paper where we go through all the plays. There's more plays under this, but I'm telling you, right, there is real gold in the hills there to migrate commercials. And this is what we're doing, right? We are reducing the cost of sales and marketing by using different channels to pick the money off the table. And by the way, this is not a flash cut. This is not a flash cut. We've been studying this. We have a paper on this and another paper, the four layers to layer efficiency. There are distinct phases you go through as a company. If your starting point is sales owns everything and you want to end to a place where you're much more optimized and efficient there, there are stages you go through. And I want to talk to the salespeople in this room right now. Sales leadership, CROs. This is where we see the resistance on this lever. Sales does not want to give this control up, right? They do not. But I'm going to ask the sales leaders in this room, what's going to be harder? What is going to be harder in the future? Because they're coming for your headcount as well. If a company has got to get sales and marketing costs down, which every as-a-service company I know does, they're looking at the easiest lever, headcount. They are looking at sales headcount. And then, eventually, they're going to look at you and say, oh, but we have to grow again. <laughs> now we've got to grow, but you have less people. Isn't it going to be easier to migrate, to get the cost down by migrating some of the commercials off your plate and focusing on the big stuff? Last big lever here, modifying the growth levers. Our last book, Digital Hesitation, we talked about the North Star of data. We now have data we never had before. Telemetry from our products, from marketing, from third-party sources, right, from our website. All this data unlocks new data-driven growth levers. Instead of having to have a salesperson knock on the door, there's other ways to drive growth. Now, I have spoken about all these levers uh, in past keynotes. I'm only going to hit on two today. And the first one is product-led growth. 
a lot of energy around this, but I was talking to a CCO a month ago about product-led growth. And he said to me, he said, Thomas, I gotta tell you, I've worked at PLG companies born that way, and I've worked at traditional software companies. And I gotta tell you, these traditional software companies do not get PLG. It's not in their DNA, it's not how they design products, they really, really struggle with that. And I agree. But I think for every company in this room, there's sort of, I'll say, two aspects of PLG that is within your grasp. One is just looking at your sales cycle and looking where you can digitize that motion. I've talked to many sales leaders, CEOs on this one, and I say, look, analyze how your salespeople actually mature an opportunity. How manual is that? Is there anything about that that you could digitize? Just doing demos, free trials, anything. And everybody says, yes, we're pretty manual there. So that's one you can go after. The second one, which is really interesting, is digital customer success motions through the product for your large customers. Digital customer success has always been viewed as that's how we take care of the, the long tail, right? The smaller customers. That's digital. These big customers, they get the white gloves, they get people on that. But there are motions there, onboarding, whatever, that you can make more digital. And you should. So your CSMs can focus on other things. So we have a lot of headroom on this lever. The other one, though, is data-driven sales. We had a whole chapter on this in the last book. And we know, again, definitively, if you use data in your sales motions, good things happen. Use data around renewals. Renewal rates get better. Use data to prioritize what target accounts you go after. Growth rates are better. Use data to prioritize what your upsells should be, that you're, you're positioning. Growth gets better. And again, what we're talking about with these levers is going from left to right again to reduce the cost of sales and marketing, reduce CSM, unbuild CSM motions. And, you know, I, I have to ask, I was going to do a poll on this, but I didn't want to look at the abysmal results. But raise your hand if you have a data-driven sales organization. Your sales reps wake up every morning and the first thing they do is look at telemetry to prioritize their day. Anybody? Can I get one hand? All right, awesome. I want to talk to you after this. Well, there's a unicorn in the back of the room. Take a picture. That's my point. That's the reason I didn't poll on this. Your sales teams have got to become data-driven. They have data that was never available before. This is a new game. And again, it's about sales efficacy. These new growth levers allow you to grow more cost efficiently. And simply cutting sales and marketing budgets and not having new engines and new plays is not going to get you there for future growth. So as JB mentioned, there are 12 plays here. There's a paper re releasing at the conference. You can grab it. Under these three levers, more plays. We prioritize them from what we see as typically the easiest to run to the hardest. So you guys have lots of homework on how to make things more profitable. And I, again, will assert here, this is relevant to everybody in the room, not just born to cloud companies. Everybody in the room, these plays are applicable. Now, I'm going to give you a way to assess where you are, <laughs> to kind of test, like, hey, Thomas, I think we're, we're doing pretty good, or maybe I'm, I'm really nervous. I don't know how well we're doing. You guys want a way to kind of benchmark that? Would that be helpful? Yeah? Some people are like, oh, I hate, I hate benchmarking. I don't, want to, I don't want to look at the data. So the first lens here, I need to introduce the rule of 35. Everybody know the rule of 40? Cloud companies have been living off of this. Grow 40%, break even, it's okay, you're a rule of 40 company. Grow 50%, lose 10%, that's okay, you're a rule of 40 company. A little while ago, we introduced the rule of 35 to complement that. And the rule of 35 says, take your revenue, subtract sales and marketing costs, subtract technology cogs. You still should have 35% left over to pay for G&A, R&D, and be profitable. Now, these two rules together 
are pretty slick. Because every quarter, we map tons of companies we track, the Cloud 40 index, the TNS 50 index, and we put them on this grid. And companies that are above that horizontal line are rule of 40 companies. Companies to, the, um, to your left of that <laughs> are rule of 35 companies, OK? And it creates four zones. If you're up and to the right, you are rule of 35 and a rule of 40 company. You're sitting on a really wicked cool business model. Zone two, you're just rule of 40. And you know, investors were giving rule of 40 companies a lot of love, less so now. Zone three, you're operationally efficient. You're a rule of 35 company, but you're not growing. Zone four, you're not growing, and you're not operationally efficient. You want to see the bad news on this? Q1 snapshot, Cloud 40, TNS 50, that's the percentage of companies that are down in zone four. Everybody, if you're down there, you got to at least get to the right and then start to get back up. And it's not impossible. Every quarter we take that snapshot and I do this slide in my webinar. There are companies that are rule of 35 and rule of 40 companies. They are sitting on fantastic business models. It can be done. That's one lens. Take yourself and bounce it against that grid. See where you are. See where your competitors are. Second lens I'm going to give you is RAC, revenue acquisition costs. So everybody knows CAC. Right? Customer. Okay. So raise your hand if you track, religiously track CAC. Bullshit. <laughs> I don't believe you. <laughs> We've been trying to benchmark CAC for years, and it is a finger in the wind for most companies. Uh, it's about a dollar ten. I think it's about a dollar ten for every dollar of revenue. People don't really know. And if you are tracking it religiously, kudos to you. That's great. So we created a proxy metric, which is super easy to calculate. It's called RAC, Revenue Acquisition Cost. And all you do right, is you take how much you're spending on sales and marketing, and you divide into that your growth rate. So if you're spending 40% on sales and marketing, and you're growing 40%, your RAC would be one. Simple math. You can do this for any public company, which is beautiful. You can see, again, how you compare. Well, what does good look like right now? Q1 snapshot, the rack, average rack number for born in the cloud companies, 1.8 or 1.81. Here's the more interesting thing. Here's the trend. Last year it was going up and up and up. Why? Growth was starting to slow. SaaS companies weren't cutting their costs yet, and so by definition, rack got worse, right? Sales and marketing still high, growth slowing down. What happened? starting last year, cutting our way to success. That's why that rack number went down. It's not because growth numbers magically came back. We're just whacking sales and marketing. That's fine in the short term, not sustainable in the long term. The other thing I can tell you is that this is a serious competitive advantage. If your rack is significantly lower than your competitors, that's huge. And there are companies out there that have wicked low racks. And we see this big correlation. Companies that have racks that are lower than the industry average typically are more likely to be profitable. I've been studying this for quite a while. So two lenses you can use to see how you're doing, OK? Promise you you're going to go test and see, all right? Go see how you're doing. So I realize that I put a lot on the table here and a lot of additional resources. Um, and I also realize that this is a really important time in history for our industry because of this crazy pivot we, we have to live through. And so we're going to do something that we've never done before. But I am willing to meet with any executive team for 90 minutes to have this conversation to talk about what it's going to take to have a profitable as a service business. What's it going to take to get to the knot hole, regardless of where you are in one of those three stories? We've never done this before. 
So if you're interested in that, put your name in the hat. I think we're going to cap it maybe at like 100. I did something like this under the covers during COVID. I met with 86 executive teams. Um, but I know the reason I'm doing this, there's a lot of arm wrestling. There's a lot of debating. But we'll go back to the frog. You need to jump. <laughs> you need to make a move here. We want to help with that. And our research continues on this. We have this concept of research journeys, profitable technology business models, profitable as a service is what we're focused on. I'm launching a survey around the fine-tuning of the financial model. How many of you are debating, gosh, how much should we be carving out for you know, free CS services? Is that a debate? What percentage of revenue should go in there? How much should we carve out for support? We're going to get to those numbers. We've got a survey going here. It's a really tight instrument. It's about 14 questions, really designed to be answered by your CFO or somebody in finance. But everybody wants this data. So jump on that. So I'm going to close here. And again, I put a lot on the table. I just want you to walk away with three images, OK, three images. Number one, as JB put on the table, there is this massive pivot. And folks, it is not going back next year. It's not going back the year after that. Everything I read, every executive I talk to, every podcast I listen to, this is a fun, fundamental shift in how we're going to operate in tech for many years to come. OK? So it's real. This is the journey everybody in this room has to help on. We've got to go left to right. We've got to get sales and marketing costs down. We've got to monetize services. We've got to get the technology cogs down. It is now non-negotiable. The good news is we know what levers to pull. We know where to jump. Don't be trying to figure this out. You don't have to. So, you know, I personally, I don't want to be part of the greater full theory of investing. I don't. I want to work with people that want to build profitable businesses that are good for your investors, that are good for your employees, that are good for your customers. That's what I want to do. And I think if that's what you want to do, you came to the right conference. Thank you.